Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Now to Lebanon. French President Jacques Chirac condemned those who want the worst for Lebanon. His statement was made following two explosions in the northern Beirut Christian neighborhoods over a four-day period. After midnight, an explosive device went off inside a shopping mall in al Khaslik, killing two people from India and Sri Lanka and wounding four others. This is the second explosion in four days. At sunrise, the residents woke up to destruction. This attack seems to be part of a series of planned operations aimed at shaking the security situation in Lebanon in light of the political crisis in the country. The targets of the two explosions were shopping malls. The destruction paints a picture of the Lebanese situation serving contradictory political goals at this stage. We were asleep when the explosion happened. It is scary. It reminds me of the war. It is very scary. What can I tell you? Take a look. It's as if we are in Fallujah. Look at the destruction. There's a lot of destruction. The ceiling caved in, and the windows and eyeglasses are broken. There are fears in Lebanon that the Tisleek explosion and before that the Juana operation are mere introductions to other attacks in which the security agencies may not be able to handle, especially since the group responsible for these explosions remains unknown. These attacks have a negative impact on the security of the country and its economy as well. A number of people are warning that such explosions are introductions to a wide-scale security collapse. Perhaps it's aiming at engulfing the country in a civil war, an idea rejected by all sides. We all have to understand the extent of this dangerous situation. We all must support His Excellency, the President, who wants to keep Lebanon united, sovereign and free. I say that all these attempts will not be beneficial. What is happening today in Lebanon is a result of the stressful political situation. And these are miserable attempts by the Lebanese and Syrian security agencies, whom I directly accuse until they prove otherwise. What message is this explosion sending, and to who? The Lebanese people are wondering where the next explosive device will go off and asking, how long will the crisis last? The Arab League summit in Algeria was concluded with a final statement calling for activating the Arab Peace Initiative. The statement confirmed that the Arab leaders have agreed to the establishment of an Arab parliament and amending the constitution of the Arab League. The Algeria summit statement praised the Iraqi elections, stressing the unity of Iraq and its land. The statement also called for holding an international conference to identify and differentiate between terrorism and the nation's right to resist the occupation. In the closing ceremony of the Arab League summit, a final statement was issued known as the Algeria Declaration. Arab leaders reiterated their support for Arab issues, emphasizing their rejection of foreign intervention that some Arab countries are being subjected to. The most important issue was confirming the need for a just and comprehensive peace according to the Arab Peace Initiative, International Resolutions, and the Madrid Conference. They also agreed to continue their efforts to develop and modernize the Arab League and make it more effective. Materializing the reforms that we have achieved of the Arab League, which include the establishment of an interim Arab parliament and an agency to follow up on how countries are implementing resolutions. The UN Secretary General was the guest of the closing ceremony. He gave a speech mentioning all Arab crises by name, including the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the return of sovereignty to Iraq, bringing 
peace to Sudan and democracy and human rights in the Arab world and its regimes. Concerning the Lebanese-Syrian issue, Anand took advantage of the situation, demanding that Syria complete the withdrawal of its forces from Lebanon, pointing out that a more comprehensive investigation is needed in the assassination of the Lebanese Prime Minister Rafi al-Hariri. We are sending a fact-finding team and it will present me tomorrow with a report that I will present to the United Nations Security Council. It is only a fact-finding team. Such case needs more than one fact-finding team. However, the Libyan leader, Muammar Gaddafi, also took advantage of Anand's presence to express his opinion of the UN Security Council and its resolutions. The Palestinian refugees in Lebanon are your guests. Of course, one day they will return to their country and thus they are not above the law. The Palestinian president sees the Beirut initiative as the best solution and that the Arabs must sell it to the American and Israeli publics. Arabs have concluded their summit. They announced what they wanted in the final statement. The rest was resolved in side meetings. Nisreen Sadiq, Abu Dhabi Television, the chambers where the Arab League summit was held, Algeria. Arab leaders relaunched a 2002 peace initiative which offered Israel normal relations in return for full withdrawal from Arab lands to the 1967 borders, as stated previously in a Jordanian proposal. A communique read out at the final session of the 17th Arab Summit in Algiers by Arab League Secretary General Amr Musa said peace was the Arab strategic option to settle the Arab-Israeli conflict. Condemning the U.S. sanctions against Syria as an obstacle to a comprehensive peace in the Middle East, Arab leaders called on Washington to resort instead to dialogue with Damascus to resolve differences between the two countries. The communique also stressed Iraq's sovereignty and territorial integrity, calling for the formation of an Iraqi government that represents all Iraqi people. Ayatollah Khan has more details. The Arab summit came to an end, steering clear of the region's most contentious issues. The outcome of the summit included a relaunch of a previously proposed Middle East plan to normalize relations with Israel. The summit's final declaration made peace with Israel conditional on the creation of an independent Palestinian state and the return of Palestinian refugees. But the gesture was swiftly rejected by Israel as a non-starter. The final communique also condemned terrorism in all its forms, regardless of its motives and justifications. Also today, Arab League Secretary General Amr Musa announced the creation of a pan-Arab parliament for the 22-member Arab League. Earlier, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan addressed the closing session, announcing that a UN report on the assassination of former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri would be released within days, but said a deeper investigation might be needed. Annan hailed Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's commitment to carry out a total pullback from Lebanon. In Lebanon, the vicious assassination of former Prime Minister Hariri was a severe blow. He was a Lebanese patriot, a formidable statesman, and a vital presence in the international community. Within the next few days, I expect to release a report of the fact-finding mission I established in the wake of the killing, and I believe a more comprehensive investigation may also be necessary. All parties must now work together to safeguard Lebanon's stability and national unity. I am encouraged by the commitment given by the Syrian President, uh, Assad, Mr. Uh, President Assad to me and to my special envoy that he will fully and completely implement Security Council Resolution 1559. I expect the full with withdrawal of all Syrian troops including the intelligence apparatus and military assets to take place before the Lebanese parliamentary elections. 
Palestinian officials described the atmosphere among Arab countries as positive, saying they were unanimous with regards to the Arab Peace Initiative. Then I think that the atmosphere is positive, uh, and I do believe that uh, there is a consensus among the Arab leaders that the issue of normalization will never be raised before the Israeli implementation of the international legitimacy uh, and accepting the vision of having two states or two peoples. Like at every annual summit, he had something rather unusual. It was Libyan leader Muammar al-Qadhafi that grabbed the spotlight at the summit as he vented at length on Arab grievances about international relations. On the Syrian troop withdrawal from Lebanon, the Libyan leader said it was better to have the guns of Syria and Lebanon than the guns of other regional countries. And on the Palestinian-Israeli crisis, Qadhafi referred to both the Palestinians and the Israelis as idiots for seeking separate states, leaving the Palestinian president in stitches. ما تزعلش الفلسطينيين اغبياء والاسرائيليين اغبياء لماذا؟ حنقنعكم حنوضحكم نوضحكم بانهم اغبياء Qaddafi said that the Israelis were wrong to try to hold on to the West Bank in the face of Palestinian attacks and the Palestinians were wrong to have set up their own state after 1948. His solution was to have a single state. Even the United Nations wasn't spared of Qaddafi's lashes. The Libyan leader, famous for walking out of the annual event before it ends and who was not scheduled to address the summit, accused the UN Security Council of double standards over the Security Council resolutions, calling it a terror council. He questioned why UN resolutions against poor countries must be fulfilled and not against Israel or other Western nation. And so the 2005 Arab summit ends, with leaders pledging Arab support for Syria, Lebanon, and the Palestinians to recover land occupied by Israel. They will meet next year in the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. Ali Atuqan, Jordan Television. Qaddafi made a speech today in Algiers, making it clear that he knows how to make jokes. We did not make any edits. Please forgive me, brother Abu Mazen. Do not get angry. The Palestinians are idiots and the Israelis are idiots. Why? I will convince you. You say that Sharon is the enemy of the Palestinians and Arabs and that he is a murderer. I think he is a Palestinian collaborator among the Israelis because he's doing things that lead to the killing of hundreds of Israelis. He must be a collaborator who was planted among the Israelis. I hope that you no longer use the war solution. The war solution is very dangerous. Even exterminating the refugees is considered a solution. Of course, exterminating the Palestinian refugees could be viewed as a solution to their problem. They would just say, there are no more refugees and the problem is solved. Assad said to our reporter in Algiers today that Syria wants peace in the Middle East with Israel. From Algiers, our correspondent, Gideon Katz. Assad was one of the leaders that Abu Mazen met today in Algiers as part of his call to assist the Palestinian Authority. Assad also had a long meeting with Colonel Qaddafi, and at the end of the conversation he answered my question about peace positively. Abu Mazen suggested that there should be a presidential delegation that would go to Washington that would include the Palestinians, Syria, and Israel. However, Omar Musa said that only the Saudi plan from Beirut will be the one that is approved. Full peace and normalization for the return of all territories without the Jordanian additions. The King of Jordan is one of the nine leaders who did not come to the summit. President Bouteflika talked about the world Jewish conscience, recognizing the weakness of the Arab organization. In the, Arab world, the Arab world has achieved some progress towards democracy, which can be ignored, but that does not change the fact that it is still in a state of backwardness in the ears of development. 
The obstacles are the results of wasting and diverting the efforts of Arabs and divisions among them. The talks and discussions will continue this evening and tomorrow. The Arab League Summit started with a wide range of topics on its agenda, including reviving the Arab Peace Initiative and adopting a number of reforms to the Arab League, as well as addressing other political issues such as the situation in Palestine, Iraq and Sudan. Big challenges and difficult tasks are awaiting Arab leaders in their summit in Algeria. The challenges include internal conflicts. This is the second Arab summit to be held while Iraq is under American occupation with the objective of controlling the deteriorating situation in the land of the two rivers, but the Arab leaders' ability to do so is very limited. The Arab League seems to be unable to condemn the occupation with words. We may assume that they are doing so in their hearts, but that is not enough. The Israeli occupation of Palestine was confronted with strong criticism and condemnation for the past 50 years. But because words are not followed by actions, the Israeli occupation increased and expanded to include parts of other Arab countries with blatant American blessings. The attempt of Arab leaders to appease their American master were evident in their rush to normalize their relations with Tel Aviv. Arab leaders can no longer say who their enemy is, and the justification they use is their political realism and the wishful temptations of the so-called peace process. The Lebanese President Lahoud did not attend the Arab League summit in Algeria, despite the fact that his country is going through a crisis in its relations with Syria, which should be one of the most important Arab issues. The Arab internal conflicts are present among neighboring and distant Arab countries. The Asian country of Saudi Arabia has a strong dispute with the African country of Libya. Images of ethnic conflicts and civil wars are evident in Sudan and Somalia. The Arab world is going through difficult problems, making people pessimistic about the possibility of finding solutions, at least in the current time. In Iraq, four Iraqi students were killed and others were wounded, including three teachers, in a missile attack by unknown armed men targeting an elementary school in the Almeria neighborhood, west of the capital of Baghdad, where an explosive device detonated, killing two Iraqi policemen. Here at the Muhasim Elementary School in the Amaria neighborhood west of Baghdad, students were studying in peace when they heard a terrifying explosion. Children and teachers escaped in fear. All of the kids could have been killed. <laughs> May God be angry with those who did this. Students in their blossoming age were killed by the missiles of unknown armed men without mercy. Others were wounded. Immediately after the news was out, relatives went out to check on their children. The police who began investigating this incident confirmed that the school is in a residential neighborhood and there are no military sites near it. They said that this was a crime against innocent students. Meanwhile, two Iraqi policemen were killed by an explosive device while trying to save civilians. It was planted by armed men in the Ishkan neighborhood west of the capital. They were trying to disarm it when it exploded. The expert kneeled down and got near it, little by little. There were two of them and one person was behind. Then it exploded. The two were martyred and the other was wounded. In the Mansour neighborhood, there was a march organized by members of the Iraqi People's Party. Banners were raised calling for the withdrawal of American forces and the creation of a unified Iraq based on peace and the nullification of most of the laws that were established in the past two years, among them the dissolving of the Iraqi army. 
During the symposium in Washington, a number of American media experts said that the events of September 11th marked the beginning of a new era of secrecy creating a dark cloud over the truth, perhaps curbing the freedom of the press under the pretext of protecting national security. The media plays a role in protecting American national security. It is partially responsible for exposing the government's violations and mistakes, especially when it insists on secrecy, claiming that it is necessary for national security. This issue sparked a debate between attorneys and media representatives. Attorney Eugene Fidel criticized some journalists, saying that they only receive government information supporting the government's point of view. The people, who are responsible for newsroom the people who are responsible for the newsroom budgets do not provide sufficient funds to implement the crucial role of the news. Mr. Fidel criticized what he described as the media race to the bottom and their coverage of trivial news such as the trial of Michael Jackson and others, ignoring other important issues which provide vital understanding of the truth of today's world. He also criticized some journalists for relying on unknown sources to disseminate news and many injustices, such as the case of James Reese, the Islamic cleric in Guantanamo, who was unjustly accused of spying. His case, began. His case began on a very sour note. The conservative Washington Times leaked news hinting that he is guilty of spying and of criminals punishable by the death penalty. They did not prove anything against him and all charges were dropped. Some journalists denounced the methods of politicizing news of national security and the American administration taking advantage of the threat of terrorism for political purposes. Some of them criticized recent actions by the American administration, as newspapers revealed that the White House produced news stories that praised the White House policies. Uh, the thing about the administration airing certain reports on local television stations is that these stations are responsible for informing its viewers of the source of such information, but we exposed this in the newspapers. The situation of the American media in relation to national security was summarized by the participants in two examples. One of them said that the fear of terrorism is bigger than the fear of atomic annihilation during the Cold War, and the media is playing a role in this. Meanwhile, others are saying that the situation of journalists is similar to the war correspondents accompanying the invading forces in Iraq, relying on government information without investigating the issue or seeking alternative sources of information. Tabet al Bardisi, Al Alam TV, Washington. Washington. The Palestinian Prime Minister Ahmed Karay met today with American Security Envoy William Ward. The U.S. National Security Advisor conducted talks with the Israeli Prime Minister and his deputy, Shimon Peres. Meanwhile, Israeli authorities closed off most of the crossings in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip until next Sunday due to the Jewish holiday. Hours after its withdrawal from Tulkarim, the occupation forces returned to the surrounding villages and carried out wide-scale activity and arrests. Meanwhile, they imposed a complete closure of the Palestinian territories until Sunday due to the Jewish holiday. Under these occupation developments, the U.S. National Security Advisor began meetings with the Israelis. He met in a closed meeting with Sharon, and then he met with his deputy, Shimon Perez. Elliot Abrams requested clarification regarding Israeli settlement expansion, especially in Jerusalem. However, the Palestinians are not pleased with the latest American movements. The letter of guarantees that Bush sent to Sharon, in exchange for Sharon's agreement to the roadmap with 14 reservations, is in direct support of the settlements. What is being demanded is the stopping of settlements and the complete implementation of the Hague Court decision. 
The U.S. official will meet with the Palestinian side tomorrow at the same time that the U.S. security envoy, William Ward, continues his meetings. He met with the Palestinian prime minister and learned about the escalating Palestinian anger over the occupation practices, the most dangerous being the apartheid separation wall and the settlements, as well as the annexation of land and property. This makes progress on the security side almost impossible. Despite this fact, the Palestinian Authority continues to reconstruct its security forces with weapons and training to carry out its commitments, confirming they will have a new role. According to official information, the Legislative Council in its current role is expected to pass a new bill that will organize the entire security apparatus. In the Palestinian view, the latest American activities are not useful because they are not accompanied by real pressure on Tel Aviv to stop its settlement operations and wide-scale annexation of land, especially in occupied Jerusalem. Iranian nuclear negotiator Sirus Nasseri said on Wednesday, the future of Iran-EU talks over to Iran's nuclear dispute is unpredictable. <laughs> Elaborating on today's gathering in Paris, Nasseri told Arabi television hours ago that officials from Iran and the three European countries reviewed the outcome of the previous negotiations. He noted the gathering set an eye on guarantees to be given by Europe. Nasseri went on to say the committee was tasked with convening a nuclear session in the weeks to come to deal with technical aspects of the case. Nasseri also pointed out both sides must take, must make efforts to reach an all-embracing and long-term agreement under Paris Agreement and Tehran's nuclear, he added, Tehran's nuclear case is, however, highly complicated. Iran's nuclear negotiator concluded the talks to be held in two to three weeks will deal with nuclear issues. Prior to Iran-EU talks, Iranian nuclear negotiator Hossein Musavian said the progress the talks have witnessed so far has failed to meet Tehran's expectations and that Iranian officials are looking for a more positive outcome. Musavian then stressed precise, unbiased, and full observance of the non-proliferation treaty is Iran's main criterion in its talks with the European Big Three. He went on to say Washington is pursuing a complete freeze to Tehran's uranium enrichment process. However, as Musavian added, Tehran Declaration and Paris Agreement serve as sources of reference for Tehran under which suspension of uranium enrichment has been a voluntary act aiming to build international confidence in a certain time span. Uh, anything other than this, Musavian concluded, will be a blatant violation of Paris Agreement. British Prime Minister Tony Blair is still emphasizing that for the time being, no plan has been drawn for waging a war on Iran because he stressed, quote, Iran is not Iraq. Blair then said he had no information on any military measures taken so far against Iran. He stressed what's going on now is diplomatic solutions and nothing else. This is while Jordan's King Abdullah has once again repeated his unfounded allegations against Iran. Israeli papers have said the Jordanian king in his talks with the Zionist regime's state officials accused Iran and Syria of destabilizing the region. King Abdullah had recently warned Tel Aviv of orchestrated attacks. Jordan and Israel share a common stance on Iran. King Abdullah has called for drawing a red line for Tehran. Majority of American people oppose military action against Iran. Despite decidedly negative views American officials have offered on Iran, they stop short of backing potential military action against the country. 66% of Americans say they oppose U.S. military action against Iran, while just 28% say they would favor it. The figures revealed in the public opinion made by Gallup organization late February shows most Americans oppose the idea of attacking Iran after U.S. President George W. Bush divided the world states into two categories of for and against America and named Iran the potential threat to the United States. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide 
and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities. And the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedahl Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.